cup of the time. So be sure to grab your tea, grab a seat, and tune in to Miss Liz. Tea time, making a difference. One cup at a time. Good morning and welcome to Tea Time. That's right, we're back and we're back for a new month. We're in the month of June and today is June 1st, 2023. We're already six months into 2023. Who knew, right? So this morning we do have a hard so a topic. So trigger warnings will be put on during the show. Uh, I will not be offended if you cannot tune in because it is going to be a hard topic. I myself am pulling myself together because as everyone knows, I lost my beautiful little girl uh, Ashley in 1988. So we're going to be talking about miscarriages and premature um, and child loss. So we're going to be talking about a lot of hard, heavy topics. But we have the incredible Michelle Bel Belicanus joining us. From She is the founder of the Colette Louise Tezel Foundation. And we're going to talk about all the incredible work that this woman does through the loss of her beautiful daughter, Colette Louise so we're going to do the disclaimer, we're going to get some bio on Michelle, and then we're going to get Michelle to come in here, and we're going to spill a strong TEA this morning with all of you guys. So grab your tea, grab your coffee, make sure to grab your breakfast, we all need our breakfast, and enjoy the show. Disclaimer for Miss Liz's Tea Time Live Shows. Miss Liz myself is going live using StreamYard. Before leaving a comment, please grant StreamYard permission to see your name at StreamYard.com. Please be advised that the content brought forward for any Tea Time show hosted by myself, Miss Liz, is always brought forward in good faith. However, may bring forth dialogue and opinions that are not representative of my platform. The facts and information are perceived to be accurate at the giving time of airing. All Tea Time guests and audience participants are responsible for using their good judgment in taking any action that may relate to the discussion. The content brought forward may include discussion for some where they may be emotionally at risk. It is significant to know that the show is engaging in discussion forms only to offer and inspire awareness and connection and is not providing therapeutical advice. If you have any questions about the disclaimer or the panelist discussion, you may freely contact me, Miss Liz, through my email at bookingmissliz at gmail.com. Moving forward, should you choose to voluntarily participate in today's show in any aspect, I myself, Miss Liz, welcomes you. And should you decide that this show is not made for you at this time, I respect your wishes and will see you at a later show at a later dating time. And again, all tea times this year in 2023 are done on Thursday, unless it's a rescheduled tea time, which will be a Monday or a Tuesday. So let me give you a little bit on Michelle. Uh, good old technology here. We got something that shut us down. Uh, Michelle Velikina is the proud mom of her angel sweet pea, who she lost due to miscarriage. Her angel daughter, Colette Louise, who she lost at nine days old and her only living child, her rainbow baby, Elliot Miguel. Inspired by the journey with Colette, Michelle and her husband founded the Colette Louise Tizzo Foundation, whose mission is to improve outcome of pregnancy, childbirth, prematurity, and infancy, as well as aid in the grieving process through financial assistance, education, and advocacy. I'm gonna, the, their flag, Flagship program financially assists families dealing with high risk and complicated pregnancies, NICU stays and loss. The organization's ability to help families 
rely on donations and grants, and they are grateful if you are able to donate. Michelle also participates in advocates on issues of maternity health, maternity mor mortality, infant health and safety, and pregnancy complications. Michelle lives in Glenview, Illinois, with her son, Elliot, and husband, Mark, and her dog, Nemo. So let me get Michelle in here, and then we're going to spill you a good strong tea and some good awareness on such a hard topic. So welcome, Michelle. Hi. Thank so, you for Michelle, me. So, Michelle, before we get started on Colette Louise, let, mm -hmm. give me a little bit on who Michelle is. Um, yeah, okay. Um, typical mom, I was like, wait, I have to talk about myself? Hold on. Um, so I am 41. I'm married to an amazing man. Um, we'll be married seven years in August. Um, and I... And sort of, I, I call myself kind of a recovering attorney. Um, so I am an attorney uh, by profession and I've worked uh, for about a decade, um, primarily helping uh, domestic violence victims and sexual assault victims. And I love that and um, transitioned a little bit out of practice, but still in the field. And when everything happened with my daughter, um, Clet, I, just found myself not having the same desire to go back into that work and really felt like I had a different mission and a different push and that being a mom was, was pushing me somewhere else. And that's when, you know, I left and I started everything. Um, and I love being a mom. I have an almost three year old. Um, he will be three next month and um, he is just amazing. And, you know, just totally, um, you know, everything I wanted in being a mom and everything I, I visioned in being a mom, right? Um, and, you know, that comes with all sorts of things, right? It, it's yeah. it's wonderful and it's amazing and it's joyful and I'm so grateful. And I also grieve that this is my only living child. And um, I grieve that I don't get to be a girl mom in the way that I thought I would be. Um, and I grieve that he will not have a sibling in the traditional sense, um, like other friends will. Um, and, you know, so I think just all of that. Um, but, you know, these days, uh, I love being a mom to, to all of my kids and, you know, and trying to do this. And so I think um, that's really my first goal. And, and um, I've always seen the work as the foundation is just my way of parenting Clet. Um, so not at all like I ex expected. Um, but it's a different form and it's still me um, being a mom and I love doing it. And when I have some free time, I love to, um, I love TV and movies. I love to knit. Um, I love reading. And um, when I get a chance to do any of that um, in my free time, um, then um, that's always great. So, um, but most of the time, you know, it's being a mom and that's kind of what my, what my life is. And, I like that you you put this free time, right? Because when you right. start a foundation, it's no longer free time, right? No, it's no, no. So yeah, for sure. So Michelle, your daughter uh, passed at nine days. So do you want to walk us through the process? Like, was it a complicated pregnancy? Like, sure. were you yeah. aware of yeah. it? Yeah. So, um, I'll actually just briefly start. Like, we, my husband and I, um, so we got married. Um, when we were a little bit older, um, and uh, so we started trying right away and had no reason to suspect that we would have any difficulties getting pregnant. Um, we were both pretty healthy people. There was no issues. Um, and what we found was uh, we ended up with a diagnosis of infertility and unknown infertility. So no real reason why. Um, there were a couple things here and there, you know, it was like, oh, well, you could maybe improve your numbers here. You can maybe improve your numbers here, but nothing concrete that would say, this is the cause. And so let's fix it. Um, so we, we did, went through um, fertility treatments that didn't work uh, and finally went to IVF. Um, so we have only ever conceived through IVF. Um, and I got pregnant my first round and we were thrilled and shouted from the rooftop. And that was our sweet pea who we lost um, at about seven and a half weeks of pregnancy. And that was in May 
of 2017. Um, and, you know, just really uh, no real answer, no real known cause. Um, the best thing they could tell us was that, you know, if you genetically test embryos, hopefully this won't happen again. Um, and so we tried again and uh, that did not take. And then we ended up switching doctors and, and practices. And um, on our third round, we got pregnant with our daughter, Clad. And it was a pretty normal pregnancy. Um, I was considered high risk because of my age and having had a loss. Um, but otherwise, it was a pretty normal pregnancy. Um, I think morning sickness is like the worst um, named thing in the world. I don't think I've ever found anything that's more poorly named because I was sick all the time, all day. Um, but, you know, other than that, I was pretty, you know, doing pretty well. Um, and when I was 21 weeks pregnant, I went to a standard OB appointment and my blood pressure was 188 over 110. Um, and just to give a perspective, like the normal, the ideal is 120 over 80. So I had, you know, completely passed that up. Um, and, you know, they tried uh, several times, you know, they, they let me um, rest. They had taken it right when they had walked me through um, the doctor's office. They were like, maybe that's what it is. So, you know, let's have a moment. Um, and my OB told me uh, to go over to labor and delivery. And when I went over, um, <clears throat> you know, what we found is actually, so on the way, my, my husband and I were joking um, saying, you know, it's so crazy. This would be the kind of thing that would happen to us that we're going to go and my blood pressure is going to be totally normal. It's just going to be some fluke because we hadn't heard a heartbeat. We hadn't done anything. So we're going to go over there and they're going to like laugh at us, right? Like we're going to be the big joke of this hospital. Um, that was not the case. Uh, and so my blood pressure had not lowered and in fact had risen slightly. Um, and so a lot of stuff happened very, very quickly and, you know, a lot of in and out of doctors and they said, well, we're going to admit you. Um, and nobody really said what that meant. Um, and the only thing I, I remember the doctors talking about was a 24 hour urine test. And so in my book, I thought, oh, they're admitting me because they have to do this urine test for 24 hours. And so it's easier to have me just be here and do yeah. this. Um, so I was looking at, I was staying one night, maybe two nights, and that was it. Um, and so we had had uh, an evening appointment with our OB. And so we had gone from work to the appointment and to the hospital. And so it was probably midnight. And my husband finally said, you know, our poor dog has not been out since early this morning. I'm going to go home and let him out and I'll get you some things. And while he was gone, my obese partner who was on call came in and said, has anyone explained to you what's going on? And I said, no. And she said, you were, you have a diagnosis of severe, of severe preeclampsia and you will be here until you deliver. And that was the evening of May 8th. I was not due until September 7th. I mean, just, completely like, you know, drop this bomb on us and our lives. Um, and so, you know, she said, do you have any questions? And, and I remember saying to her, I have a million questions and I don't even know where to start. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I messaged my husband and I was like, uh, yeah, so this is like apparently really serious and um, we should, you know, do this. And he, his response back to me, um, was you're joking, right? And I said, I'm not that creative. There's no way I could come up with this story. Um, and so, you know, very quickly from one day to the next, I had come from work. My desk was a mess. Um, you know, I had all this stuff, you know, I fully intended to be back at work the next day with no problems. And then to find out that I wasn't going to be back at work the next day. And I didn't know if I was going back to work, when I was going back to work, what was this was looking like um, with no planning, no anything. Um, and so, you know, it was a lot of stuff that was kind of thrown at us at one time. Um, and, you know, I thought about everything, right? I mean, the super serious of like, am I going to survive this? Is my baby going to survive this? Um, you know, to the mundane of like, we don't have a car seat. Oh my God, we don't have a car seat. We don't have a crib, right? Um, which now seems so ridiculous to have thought of. Um, and, you know, and then everything in between, like, how am I going to work? How am I going to 
you know, I, I managed a team. How was I going to do that? Um, I worked for a nonprofit. We had grant reports due um, and, you know, grant applications. How was I going to do that? Like all of those things floated through my mind. Um, and so it's very scary, right? And medical stuff is always kind of scary and doctors come in and not every doctor has the greatest bedside manner. So they're telling you a lot of facts and numbers and survival rates. And, you know, if you make it to week this and week that, and if you don't make it to week, then we won't intervene. And, and you're being thrown with a lot of things. Um, and, you know, just trying to sort of keep your head up over, you know, on, from underwater and, um, and life goes on. Right. Yeah. So like my job still was, you know, needing me to tell them what was going on. And, and uh, yeah, I still had to figure out how this, all this stuff that I wasn't going to be able to do in the way I thought was going to get done and all of that. Um, and really it was in the hospital that the, the first thought of this organization, this nonprofit came to me. Um, and that was because a day or two later, when things had calmed down slightly, um, I really started thinking about one thing that I wasn't asking myself was about finances. I knew we would be okay, um, but we essentially lost my salary pretty quickly. Um, I was fortunate I had a little bit of leave time and I did use that. Um, and then I was also fortunate that my job allowed me to um, be able to do some work from the hospital and so I could stretch it out a little bit longer. Um, but very quickly, we lost my salary. And that's not something that most people have prepared for. And, um, you know, we were at week 21. We were not prepared for me to lose my salary. Um, you know, there was, there was push to, do you want to go on a short-term disability? And I, I didn't because I also was anticipating um, a child coming home and, and my recovery post-birth. So I didn't want to do that. And, and so there was a lot of things that are happening. Yeah. And I just kept thinking about how many families would really um, just be completely decimated by this yeah. sort of thing. And, and I recognized my privilege and my blessing that I wasn't. Um, <clears throat> so ultimately, I was in the hospital a little over three weeks. Um, so when I had first come in uh, and done an ultrasound, I think the first full day I was in the hospital, um, they came and told us that Colette was measuring a little bit behind. So they said she's measuring about two weeks behind. The ultrasound is not a perfect system, so we usually are okay with with up to a week behind because we know it's not 100%, you know, up to date. Um, so like we're hoping with regulating your blood pressure and monitoring you that we will give her the chance to catch up in growth. And that was what it, you know, was hopeful. And so our plan basically was, I was going to be there for as long as we possible. I mean, we were hoping I was there until September and that um, we would just wait until um, either she decided to announce herself, um, the blood pressure was not able to be controlled. Um, and so it was risk to my health. Um, or there was something else that told us. And so after three weeks, I did a repeat ultrasound. And what we found was that not only was there no um, catch up, there had been no growth from the three weeks. Um, so she was now measuring, I was at 24 weeks and five days, and she was measuring at probably about 20 weeks, um, wow. really size wise. Um, so they came in and they, the doctors all recommended delivery. Uh, and they, you know, basically under the premise of there's more interventions we can do on the outside than we can do right now. And so we went ahead. Um, so emergency C-section, um, they got her out very, very quickly, um, which I was very grateful for. Um, they had told us, you know, repeatedly over and over again, um, leading up to, you know, going into the room, she's not going to cry. Um, she's too young. Uh, you guys need to be prepared for that. Um, you know, you're not going to hear her and that doesn't mean anything. Um, and they also cautioned us that, um, if they could not intubate with the smallest tube they had available, there wasn't an intervention they could do. So that was a concern because of her small size. Um, 
And, you know, that's really scary, right? And not at all the way I, I pictured childbirth was going to be, right? Yeah. You know, you think of what you've seen on TV and the movies and, um, you know, baby comes out and baby is crying and, and all of that. And it was just, um, so it was very surreal to go through it. And um, we did not find out if Claire was, uh, we did not find out the sex of the baby until um, she was born. Although I knew from like day one that I was having a girl um, and they came out and they said, it's a girl. And, and they took her off and all of a sudden the room got quieted down while they're trying to sew me back up. And I heard this like tiny, but like powerful squeak. And I remember I said, is that her? And they said, yeah. And then they said, she shouldn't be able to make that sound. And um, I was like, well, of course, it's my badass daughter who's going to, you know. <laughs> right. By <laughs> all your expectations, right? Like, okay, no problem. Um, and... And then the tube, it was actually the second to smallest tube totally fit her and did it. And I, I just, you know, for me, I was like, this is just evidence, right? Like, okay, yeah. we're going to have a struggle, um, but this is a fighter. And, you know, and she she was, and, you know, I think in very many ways she still is. Um, and went straight to the NICU. Um, I had a very um, difficult uh, rest of the surgery. They couldn't get my intestines back in. Um, my epidural wore off. I actually started to feel them on my stomach. Um, and, um, and so they put me under and we had been cautioned that they were going to do everything they could to try to prevent putting me under because of the preeclampsia. There was that, there was a lot of risk to me if, yeah. um, they did have to put me under. So they were definitely trying to delay it. And you could tell just by the activity in the room. Um, prior to that happening, my husband, we had waited a little bit and then, um, my husband had decided to go try to see her and had asked me, you know, is that okay? And, um, I had said yes. And, and so, um, he told me he loved me and gave him, you know, gave me a kiss. And, um, when they said, we're going to put you under, my thoughts were, I'm not going to wake up from this. And I, um, and, and I was prepared to. You know, I mean, that was in my book, what I had to do. Um, and so I was shocked when I woke up um, in recovery. Like, I, I, I mean, I was sort of like, wait, hold on. And, and kind of that, like, you know, you hear in movies, like the pinching yourself, like this is, this is real, right? This is happening. Yeah. Um, and, um, and they took me back up to my room. My, my husband, who's usually very laid back, um, really put his foot down and said, you have to take her to see her, see Colette. She cannot go to her room without seeing Colette. Um, and so they wheeled me in, in the hospital bed and I got to see Colette. Um, and so anyone who has ever had a preemie or a baby who I needed to go um, to NICU, um, it, there is nothing that prepares you for it. So my younger sister, um, who's four years younger than me, was a preemie. So some of my earliest memories revolve around things related to the NICU. So I felt like I would be prepared. And when it's your own kid, nothing prepares you, right? Like, it's just nothing. Um, so Clet was a little over a pound. Um, she was in an isolet. Um, we were told it would be a while before we would be able to hold her. Um, and, you know, she looks tiny and she's hooked up to all these wires and, um, because she was born so early, her eyes had not opened yet. Um, and so, you know, it's just none of it is what you expected. Um, and we just sort of, you know, became our lives. It's like, you know, revolving around going to the NICU every day. Um, and so we settled into a pattern uh, once I was released um, that my husband went back to work. And I was still home on, on leave. And so he would get up and he would leave for work early. <clears throat> and he would either stop in at the hospital on the way in, or he would call the nurses and ask how she had done. And then he would send me a text message and tell me. Um, and usually just because I was moving slower, I was usually in the process of getting ready. Um, when I didn't have to go, I had to go a lot of OB checks to um, make sure my, my blood pressure did not rise. Yeah. 
and because postpartum preeclampsia is really serious too and it's not that's definitely never talked about um and so if i didn't have to go to the doctors if i didn't have that like i was just usually moving slowly and then i would go to the hospital and i would be there most of the day um, until my husband came in from work and then we would spend some time with her and then usually we would um leave and, and grab dinner and then head home and that was our routine and so um that's what we did and the morning of may 31st um my husband went to work and then he called on his way in and then he messaged me and he said when i called to talk to the nurses the nurse said hold on and went to find the doctor and i knew that that was not good right that's you know like okay um so i got you know, ready really quickly. And I, um, headed over to the hospital and the doctor, the rotations had, had changed. And so this doctor was apparently there the night I was born, but had not been there since. So I had never met him. Um, he had met my husband, but not me. And so he came and he said, are you Clet's mom? And I said, yes. And he said, okay. He's like, well, let's talk about some things. And I said, okay. And um, I said, okay, what's up? What's going on? And he said, um, let's go find Justin Rue. And that was, you know, just very aware of that, like that this is yeah. serious. And um, and so he told me, and so we had known that this was a risk. Um, the ventilator that they tend to put um, micropremies on um, is very powerful. It saves lives. It's an incredible invention, but it's really only meant for about 24 to 48 hours of usage. Um, to really just strengthen that and then to go to another ventilator. Um, prolonged time on that ventilator can start to essentially shred the lungs. Um, and they had tried countless times to get Clet onto the other ventilator and her numbers would plummet. And so they would put her onto the original. And essentially what he explained to me was what we knew was a possibility always. Um, although I don't think we fully understood it um, was that this had finally rigged havoc on her lungs and we had to, um, you know, we had to deal with that. And so, you know, he said, we're going to do everything we can and we're going to keep doing everything. Um, it's not a crisis yet, but I think you should probably call your husband. Um, and I said, okay. And the words death, or dying or anything were never used. And so I think on some level, I was just in denial. And so yeah. I just kept thinking like, oh, this is just gonna be one of those stories we tell, right? Of like, when the doctors were thought, you know, you were, you were down for the count, like all of a sudden you pulled through and ha ha, you know, and I'm, I'm imagining in my head yeah. telling the story at, you know, her wedding and all of that. Um, and, He's, he told me, you know, you can stay in this room for as long as you want. And he said, um, okay. And then, he, you know, he turned to leave and he, he got to the door and then he turned back and he said to me, do you believe in baptism? And I said, I do. And he said, then I think it's time. And for me, that was like a click. Like that was, you know, and I wish that it had been told in a different way. And so I doubt my husband. As soon as he answered the phone, I started crying. Um, but I still lived in denial. Like, I still was in this denial. And it's like, this is just going to be one of those things, right? They're going to tell us all this down. This is what, you know, and we're just going to, it's going to yeah. go through. Um, and so we spent a lot of time um, there. And my, in the meantime, my sister and my sister-in-law and my mother-in-law had come to the hospital already. And I stepped out at one point because my mother-in-law was there. There's only two got and two people at a time who could be at the Iceland. And I decided to give her some time with um, her granddaughter and my husband and her son. And um, and I was in the family room with my sister and my sister-in-law. And um, <clears throat> my husband messaged me and said, do you want to come in and there was a shift change. And so in our NICU, and this is pretty accurate for most US NICUs, we, they have a shift change and during shift change, parents are not allowed in. Um, they're allowed 24 hours a day, except during these shift changes. And so we were coming up to, we were about maybe 10 minutes before a shift change. And so 
my husband messaged me to say, if you want to come in before shift change, let's do it now. And I was like, no, it's okay. I was like, you know, listen, let's let's take a break from this. I think we could all use it and we'll regroup and then we'll come back after shift change. And he said, okay. And then I was still in there. And then all of a sudden a nurse came in and said, um, <clears throat> mom, we need you in there. And they had cleared out everything and, um, and they were letting us stay during shift change. And that was another one of those like, Oh, they're bending the rules. They're break. Like this is this is what's happening. Um, still in denial. Um, still thinking, you know, this is just going to make for a really good story one day when yeah. she's much older. Um, and so, you know, just spent a lot of time sitting um, right by her isolate, talking to her. Um, you know, really just trying to imagine and trying to, you know, hoping, I mean, praying, whatever I, you know, we could do and could think of. Um, and then I could feel the doctor at one point started to turn to us and, and started to say something. And I don't know what he started to say, but I kind of knew in that moment that um, he was going to start to ask us to make some decisions. And I said in my head, I, I felt like I screamed it in my head. I do not know to this date if I actually screamed it out loud. Um, but I said, Clep, please don't make me make this decision. Um, and almost instantaneously, her numbers started to drop on their own. And um, so the doctor said, you know, she, she's going. And I said, no, she's not. Oh, my God, I tell this, and I usually get through it without crying. Um, and so um, the doctor said, what we can do is... Um, we can keep her alive. We can make sure she gets baptized. And we can bring her to a room and you guys can hold her. And hold her until she passes. And so that's what we did. And so, you know, um, and they had break, broken on every rule. I mean, I remember at one point while we were waiting for them to come to baptize her. I felt something on my shoulder. My husband stood next to me, holding my hand, and he felt something on my shoulder. And I realized my sister was behind me. And I thought, oh my God, they're breaking this rule and they're allowing a third person in. And there was none of that, right? And, um, you know, just all of that. And so they moved us to a family room. And by that point, my parents were there. My mother in law was there. My father in law passed 30 years ago. And, um, our sisters and their husbands. And we got to hold her for the first time. And um, so Mark, my husband and I uh, held her and, and talked to her. Um, and then everyone else got to, and then we got to hold her. And the doctor had come in twice um, because they need to find no heartbeat twice. And so yeah. he checked her and then, um, and then told us, but um, even during that, right. Which when, when he, he kind of, he didn't say much the first time, I think he was just trying to let us have that, those moments. Um, but when he came in the second time, I was like, she's going to pull through. There's going to be some, some crazy miracle that happens, right? This is what's supposed to happen. These are the stories you hear of like, you know, and then everything's saved, right? And 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 this is, you know, what I've thought. Um, and when he told us she had passed, I mean, that was just, I mean, it, you think of these moments that'll bring you to your knees. And that's the, the worst one I can think of. I mean, just to completely, um, you know, something that's very against nature, right? I mean, yeah. you, you, once you learn about death, you, you, you expect, to bury your parents. You expect to, you know, that when you get married, um, one of you is burying the other. Like you expect all of that. Um, that's circle of life. And, and not to say that that grief and that pain when that does happen isn't there, but it's part of a circle of life, right? You're right. never ever supposed to bury a child, right? And that's just, I mean, and, um, and then, 
you know, there's a lot of decisions you have to make. And I remember um, at one point them coming in and, and talking and they said, do you have a funeral home? And I, I remember thinking, no, both my parents are alive. I've never planned anything. I don't have a funeral home. Um, I was sitting by her bedside and I was thinking of things, you know, because it never occurred to me she wasn't going to come home. Mm-hmm. So I was thinking of things like if she comes home and she needs a wheelchair, um, we don't have a bedroom on the first floor. Could we make one of our rooms into a bedroom on the first floor? What would that look like? And I was thinking of, you know, how it was going to look to have how, a medical, you know, doctor's visits all the time and to, to manage a bunch of doctors, different doctors' visits. And I was thinking very much in that realm of things. And so I wasn't planning for funerals. I wasn't, wasn't planning for any of that. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's very quick decisions and, and very um, important decisions. And none of which any parent should have to make. And, you know, it's just really, um, and I think, you know, so, so we got to stay there in the room with her. Um, somebody from Now I Lay Me Down to Sleep, which is another incredible nonprofit, um, came and took pictures of her. And she was in a very pretty angel gra- gown that was made from a wedding dress. Um, and, you know, I mean, I have to say, if, if we had to do this, it was done in the most beautiful, most caring and supportive way that we could have ever imagined. Um, didn't make it any easier, but I'm, I'm always grateful that at least we had that time and that ability. Um, and then it's just, it's surreal, right? You, you kind of just, I mean, you, you go home and you're just supposed to sort of live life, right? And, and in your world, your world has completely stopped, but that doesn't mean everything else has stopped. Um, and so, you know, it's very, um, and I was also recovering from, you know, a major C-section and trying to figure out, you know, how that worked and not being able to move at the same you know, pace and in the same way as I could and, yeah. you know, all of that. And, and so it's, it's very, um, it's very overwhelming and it's, it feels like you are the only people who have ever experienced this. Um, and I think that's part of the reason why I'm so transparent and I share so much about um, my story is because if I make one less person, like one person feel less isolated and less alone, it's all worth it. And, you know, that's really what I want, want to do because um, it feels like nobody has ever gone through this. Nobody ever will go through this. You're the only person um, and you don't know what, what to do. You don't know up from down or left from right. And, you know, your baby died. I mean, how is that a world in which you're supposed to live in? Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, I will say that I think, um, so I'm a planner. I'm the planner of the family, right? And so I'm kind of the one that, you know, people can tell and I, I'm like on top of it and I'm managing all sorts of things. And I always have been. And um, for the first time ever, I found myself just unable to think of anything. You know, um, the idea of giving her a memorial was sort of this abstract concept that I couldn't really wrap my mind around. Um, And, you know, I thank God for my sister who showed up the next day and said, okay, I need you guys to get dressed. And then we need to go to the funeral home and we need to go um, to the cemetery and just basically drove us around and guided us and, and, and kind of pushed us into what we were doing. Um, and so we, we had, you know, a beautiful memorial for her. Um, and, you know, I think one thing about grief that's so interesting is I think it's, we don't talk about grief. We don't talk about death. We don't talk about loss at all in this, like in the society. Um, we definitely don't talk about it when it comes to children and babies. I mean, that's unheard of. We don't want to, you know, no. Um, 
but I think we know some of the protocols of what we're supposed to do, right? So it's easy to show up to the funeral, the, ma the memorial, right? Because it's a set thing and we know um, that it is. So um, it's easy to show up to that. But when that's over with, a lot of times people don't know what to do. And so people just hide. And, and that was, you know, definitely something we saw was um, less and less people come, you know, in the weeks after, the months after. Um, and I was really, you know, I was really struggling, right? I had, I was a mom by every definition. Um, you know, I had given birth, but I didn't have a baby. And that maternal energy, those hormones, whatever you want to call it, didn't just go away. And I think that was really something. And so um, I really started thinking about this financial piece and how we could help and really wasn't finding places that did it um, or did it in the way I thought would make the most sense. Um, and so I started reaching out and, you know, I met with the social workers at the hospital I had delivered at. Um, and, you know, just was like, Hey, do you think that this is a good idea if I start something and, you know, didn't really know what I would get in terms of reactions and really, um, the, the, you know, it was just, please do this. How can we make this happen? Um, what do we have to do? Uh, and so somewhat reluctantly, I started this nonprofit, um, and I say somewhat reluctantly, I had worked in nonprofit pretty much my whole career. And when people would say things like, oh, you should start a nonprofit. Oh, you should start a nonprofit. I would always swear up and down. I never would. Um, but all of a sudden in this, it felt like that's, that's what the world, the universe, you know, Colette was telling me to do. Um, and so we, uh, we launched, um, I kind of, you know, turned all of my energy into that. Um, I became probably a little obsessed with having it launch on Clutch due date. So September 7th of 2018. And we did. And um, our first thing was basically to provide financial assistance. And that financial assistance piece has, has stayed. Um, and that's what we're most known for. Um, and it's financial assistance in sort of what I see are the three stages of Clutch's life, but also the three stages where I think, um, you know, kind of all work together. And so the high risk pregnancy, the pregnancy that develops some sort of complications or needs some sort of restrictions, um, make you stay or loss and loss being everything from the earliest pregnancy loss all the way up to about one year of age. Um, and, you know, we started doing it and, you know, it was, it was tough to just get the word out and to get people to really believe that we weren't scamming people or, you know, there's we a lot of that though, right, Michelle, like where all these foundations are started, a lot of people right away, they assume that it's, you know, there's a scam, there's, you know, right. we're not going to donate, we're not going to support, we're not going to help because it's just another one that's being built. Right. Uh, you know, so it does take yeah. time. And I think by sharing your personal story, it also makes a difference, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Yeah. And so we did a lot. But, um, you know, one of the things I was doing was I just had created social media accounts and I started just, you know, sharing our story, um, sharing articles and information and facts that I had never known. Um, and all of that was happening. And what I was finding was that not even the people I thought I was going to reach, but, you know, um, friends were saying, oh my God, I had a friend who had a miscarriage. And then I read about some of the things you said. And so I talked to her totally differently than I would have before. Yeah. Um, people, you know, just saying like, I didn't realize how often this was happening and, you know, all of that stuff. And so there was this like aha moment of, we need to be educating people about these things too, right? Like, yeah. yes, the financial assistance piece is always going to be there and that's always important. But part of, you know, this is that we have to need to know that this is a problem and that this exists, right? And, and so when I was coming into it, sharing the story and thinking I was just trying to make parent, other lost parents feel less alone, it was like, 
also need to make all the people around them aware that this happens and that we need to do something about that. And so, you know, really just think about that. And so we added in an education piece. Um, and then I always say at the, you know, at my core, I'm a storyteller and an activist. And so we also added advocacy. Um, and I think that that's really important. I think um, we definitely need very big institutional changes um, in a lot of different ways. And I think, you know, that's everything from having paid leave to better research so that we're not having all of these, you know, babies going into NICU or, um, you know, pregnant people ending up on bed rest or, you know, babies dying or any of that. that we're not having all of that. And um, so that was kind of what became our organization. Um, I can say we are going to officially celebrate five years in September. Um, we've helped over 1,800 families across the U.S. Um, and given away more than a million dollars in grants. And yeah, you guys have done some amazing work. I got some numbers here for the listeners out there. Um, you've helped 18, uh, 1,804 families so far. Uh, you've reached over 47 states. Uh, clients you've served with 6,694 and financial grants is one million three hundred and twenty-five and three hundred and eighty-three dollars. That is amazing, Michelle. Uh, you know, and I think it's because you had that background as well for nonprofits and grants and all of that that this also helped you as well, right? For sure. Yeah. Yeah. No, definitely. Like my background helped, and um, and and really, I think you know, working with hospitals and and really establishing partnerships. I think that's really important. Um, you know any of these issues are not going to be solved by just one person or one organization. They're just not. We have really big issues in the U.S. Um, when it comes to perinatal health, um, maternal mortality, infant health, infant mortality, you know, loss, all of those things. But those are all big, huge problems, right? And it's, it's going to take a lot of different people and a lot of different entities working together to solve those things. And, you know, we are doing in the financial assistance realm, I know we are helping individual families, but we see it. There's so much need out there. Um, there's so much, so many families that are just, you know, very much like we were, right? You're going along, you think things are good, you're planning a, a baby, you know, at a certain date, and all of a sudden everything changes, um, usually without any warning. Um, you know, maybe a slight warning, maybe. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you're sort of supposed to sort of like just go with it. Um, yeah. And, you know, what I had thought of when I, when I was first thinking of this was very much um, helping families so they could continue to afford their bills and, and that, you know, kind of help. Uh, what I have learned is that, um, unfortunately, there are moms who feel like they are, they have to choose between bed rest or hospitalization and work yep. um, because one way they are putting their babies at risk and, and potentially their own health. And the other way is they might not be able to provide for their family. And especially if they have other children, you know, they kind of have to prioritize. And, and that's, again, I mean, why is a parent having to make those choices yeah. um, with no support? Um, and so we're, you know, finding that and, and finding um, just, you know, I think not only is it the loss of income that happens with any of these kinds of things, which is bound to happen, right? We lost my salary, but my husband lost some, you know, luckily had a very supportive work environment. And so took some days and actually, you know, I have, my parents were in town and near us. And so um, one of the things we did while I was in the hospital was, uh, during the week, you know, I would usually be by myself. Um, my mother-in-law who was retired at the time, um, would come, you know, a couple times during the week and other people would, um, and then on the weekends, uh, a lot of times my husband was going into work and working, you know, kind of getting that really good work in when he's not interrupted because my parents could be with me. Um, and that's how we were making it work, but that's not always possible. And there's so many things and then your expenses go up. Right. Yeah. And so 
you know, when we were in the hospital, we weren't cooking at home. Um, and so that's an expense that goes up. Um, you know, mileage, right? Our, I think right now for a NICU, our average client is traveling 50 plus miles one way wow. to visit their kids in NICU. Um, and some people are traveling, traveling 200, 250 miles. So sometimes that might be a relocation or that might be, you know, they're coming in just on the weekends and, you know, staying either at the hospital or if there is a Ronald McDonald house, um, you know, staying there or anything like that. And that's, you know, an added expense. So not only are you losing that income, um, but then you're adding on expenses that were unforeseen, right? Nobody, you know, expected to do it. Nobody expected to pay that, you know, at the time, right? And so I think um, all of that has been really huge lessons learned um, of what we're doing. But that the need is just, I mean, we went from being able to approve pretty much every application at the very beginning to now, you know, we're approving maybe about half of every application every week. Um, and, you know, it's not for lack of us being creative or um, sometimes not always being fiscally responsible because we know that we need, you know, families need it and, and they do. Um, you know, all of it I think is, is really, um, really telling and really eye-opening to me. Um, and I had the biggest vision for this, right? And I still am constantly amazed and shocked by what families are being put through. Well, and we talked about this in the backstage before the show even went live. You know, it's such a taboo. Nobody's talking about it. Why are we not talking about it? There are hundreds and thousands of people going through this each and every day. Right at this moment, there's someone going through this. Mm -hmm. So why are we not talking about this? This is the question of what we need to start asking everyone out there. Why are we not talking about grief? Why are we not talking about loss? It happens to all of us. You know, right. it's like you said, Michelle, if you haven't gone through it, somebody you know has gone through it, you right. know, and let's give people the option to share their stories and tell their stories so that we can understand, you know, just sharing a story actually educates us. It actually brings us the awareness that it could happen to us at mm -hmm. any time, right. you know, uh, we had a show uh, last month where, you know, the terror strikes, the terror strikes at any time, you know, we're, we're all affected in some way, you mm -hmm. know, through your loss, your, your parents have gone through a loss as well as grandparents, you know, we don't speak of those loss, you know, and this is why we're here on Tea Time is to bring the awareness, to educate, to advocate and say, you know what, let's start talking. Let's start being comfortable with the hard topics, you know. Let's right. hear the stories. So, Michelle, I really want to thank you, like, for sharing your story with, about Colette and the amazing foundation and the amazing work that you guys have done together, you and your thank husband. You. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Because and we do need to talk about it. I mean, right? I mean, I, I think there's a couple of things. First of all, every parent should be able to talk about every single one of their children yep. and should probably drive a few people insane over how much we talk about our children, right? Yeah. Living or not living. Um, A. B, it's happening. I mean, it's happening all over the place. I was amazed when we lost Clet, how many, you know, we were getting tons of cards or I was getting emails and, and things like that. And how many people were disclosing losses I had never known about? You know, I lost a baby at 28 weeks. I lost a baby at 20 weeks. I lost a baby at full term. I lost all of this stuff. And you go, well, why weren't you talking about this? Why didn't you make me aware yeah. of this? So at least I wouldn't have felt alone in those immediate moments. I would have been like, oh, it happened to other people. Um, and I think that that's really powerful and it's really true. And it doesn't, you know, there's no, it crosses all, you know, all classes and everything else. Um, and, you know, it can happen to anybody. And I think that that's yeah. really the, a powerful thing and, and we need to get comfortable with it um and you know i know sometimes i'll say i know it makes people uncomfortable that i talk about it but it makes me uncomfortable that i live in a world that my daughter isn't in right right I mean, that's uncomfortable and i have to live in that so you know if you hear my story for five minutes or ten minutes or if you stuck with me for an hour here um you know you were uncomfortable for that period of time and i'm uncomfortable every day 
every moment of every day of, of my life. And like, that's the difference. And I think yeah. that that's really where we have to, you know, recognize that and really sit in that um, feeling. Yeah. Well, and nothing really grows right with comfort. You know, if right. we just stay in a comfort and comfortable world, nothing changes, nothing grows, right. nothing, you know, the awareness just stays in 1960, you know, we're, we're in 2023 and we're still not talking about child loss. We're still not right. talking about these harder topics, you know, and we all, you know, mothers go out and get pregnant and, you know, couples have babies and they just expect this baby's coming home. They don't mm -hmm. expect all of the, the things that could happen, you know, uh, and I really want to get this tea time out there. So, um, for anyone that's listening now or will watch the replay, just share this tea time. If you know somebody that has lost a child or who's going through this ex this this experience right now, you know, um, I myself lost my daughter 35 years ago. And even to this day, like Michelle, like you said, we live with it every day. So if you have to hear our story for five, 10 minutes or even an hour, you know what? We live with it 365 days every year, you know, uh, special days and are harder on us, you know, so let's, Let's have some empathy for people who are going through this. Um, I do want to get your tea before we wrap up. And we might run a little over the hour. And I really believe that we will. Uh, because there's still a lot of things I want to ask you, Michelle. Um, but I want to ask you, what is your tea today? What tea would you serve to the listening audience today on your story? I think I would say truth, education, and advocacy. Um, you want to share a little bit on those words? The truth, listen, I I am fully, I mean, my other word that I was kind of thinking about when I said, when you said tea was transparency, but I think they're kind of, you know, one in the same in a lot of ways. Yeah. I tell you my, my story, right? I will tell you all of it. Um, you know, there are times when I've gotten more graphic into what it's like to go through infertility or what it's like to go through, you know, this and that, um, you know, depending on audience and, and the topic and everything. This, I lay it all out for you, right? Like this is, this is my truth. This is my story. Um, if you're willing to give me a chance to listen, I want to share that because there was so much and, you know, and I, I mean, I felt like I was an educated feminist, you know, I was older and I thought I knew everything. And it turns out I knew like very little. Um, and so that's why I want to share my truth. Um, you know, I always joke that the when they told me preeclampsia, the only thing I knew about preeclampsia was an old episode of ER when Dr. Green treats a woman in the ER with preeclampsia and she dies. That was the only thing I knew about preeclampsia. Wow. You know, at 21 weeks pregnant, at, you know, age 36, right? Um, I should have known more than that. Uh, you know, and so I think just really speaking the truth, um, I think taking some of the, you know, when we, we talk about, um, you know, bringing up these topics that are difficult for us, I think we also need to, to really be honest and to start taking away that like belief of the Cinderella story of like, you know, you find your love and you get pregnant really easily and then you just have a baby. Um, you know, and, and, and really be honest about all of that, right? Like not everybody gets pregnant really easily. Not everyone has a great pregnancy. You know, people, there are people who, who is myself included, pregnancy sucked for me in a lot of ways, right? Um, birth sucks and, and, you know, that's tough. Um, and then there's all this, the problems that it can, and, you know, and that's in a, in a somewhat normal, you know, way. Um, but there's all these other things that can happen and those are tough, right? Um, and so I think, you know, just being really true and really honest about that is really important. Um, I guess with that is educating. And I guess that's kind of like they're, they're a little bit hand in hand. Yeah. Um, you know, it's just being real about these things. Um, you know, one of the things that really was hard for me was when we were in NICU, I, I just really wish we had known that there was a possibility she could die. Um, in my book, once we made it past like 24, 48 hours, it never occurred to me that she could die. And yes, there was things like, obviously if she had had a surgery. There's an additional risks anytime any of us go under a knife. And so, yes, I understand that. But that's just that she could be in the isolate and then die. Never occurred to me. Yeah. Um, and I really wish I had had some education and some knowledge of that. I think it would have taken away some of the shock 
wouldn't have helped the grief or anything, but I think it would have helped some of the processing a little bit. Um, and then advocacy. I mean, we need to just, we need to tell people, share your story, um, you know, speak out. There is nothing, there's no harm in, in whatever way, you know, um, I think it's Shirley Chisholm has the quote. Um, and if I miss it, attributed it, I apologize. Um, but it's like, you know, speak, even if your voice shakes. Right. And, and that's the thing. Like I have told this story, you know, countless times and, you know, today I cried. Um, and I think that's largely because yesterday was, um, Claude's angel anniversary. And, um, I think there's still a lot of emotion. Um, but when I first told it, it I couldn't get through the whole story without breaking down and crying. Um, and I continued telling it, right? And then it became easier and it became easier. Um, and then I have some days like today that it was harder. And I think, you know, kind of doing all of that, um, you know, it's really important. Um, asking for change and questioning, you know, I, I, my big thing is, you know, questioning the status quo. Like, why do we do, why do, we do it this way? Um, yeah. You know, why do we do it that way? Uh, what more could we be doing? You know, all of those kinds of things I think we, we all need to be doing. Um, and so that's kind of where I would say was my piece. And then it's really strong to, you know, and we really need to get the truth out there, you know, and the truth is, and I, and I, and I really appreciate the transparency because this is what we need. We need real truth, trans, transparent, you know, when we're telling our stories and we're going to, you know, um, and maybe because we both have experienced loss, maybe there's that connection as well, you know, uh, for me, I, this tea time was hard for me. Uh, and it was also rewarding mm -hmm. and really enlightening because I feel that all the babies that have passed early have all joined together, you know, and I have this vision that they're all like, Hey, go mama, you got this, you know? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. uh, for me, I look at my, my angel daughter, Ashley, as my go to for strength, you know? So Michelle, do you do that with Colette? I do. Yeah. Yeah. I think, um, you know, I mean, here's the thing, right? Again, going back to, I'm a mom, I'm a girl mom. Right. And so, you know, yes, Colette's never going to have children and, um, and it's never going to go down that world. And I understand that, but I still fight for her and I fight for my son who I hope one day has children and, you know, whatever, and hopefully it's seamless and wonderful and a fairy tale because I hope everything is for him, right? Yeah. And I know it won't be, but um, I want to improve those things. And that that's really what pushes me to do this is my kids. And, you know, I think all of us talk about that, right? We want to create a better world for our children. Um, and I think especially in this realm, you know, unfortunately, we are behind and we have actually gone backwards some in this area. And, and I would say significantly so in a lot of ways. Yep. Um, and I think we need to keep pushing and it, and it's exhausting. Don't get me wrong. Like I, I mean, when I said in the beginning about having free time and yeah. that being, I'm constantly thinking of this, I'm constantly thinking of things, right. And whether that is, you know, more management of the foundation, whether that is trying to fundraise also like those big things, like how do we take this on this huge issue right mm -hmm. um because that's that's the bread and butter of it right how are we doing this and i think if we could answer those questions if we could really just you know start talking those conversations start you know i mean maybe that should have been my tea is talking um you know start questioning start talking and i think you know really doing that um and yeah, so I, I definitely think, you know, Claire's a source of strength. I think um, I very much feel like, you know, I mean, my joke is, right, I run this foundation my own, and my joke is that Claire is my boss. Um, so people say, oh, you work for yourself, you're, you're, you're your own boss. I'm like, well, no, my dog is my boss. Um, and I, I really do think that because, you know, this is how I'm parenting her, and this is what I am doing, and I am trying to make a better world, you know, for her. And, you know, and for my son and, and all of, you know, this next generation, um, although I keep saying the next generation is going to save us. Um, but, uh, you know, I think that's really where I draw my strength from a lot. Yeah. 
Well, I've, I find that our, our, our children who have passed are our stepping stones and our, our go-getters and our boss, like you said, you know, right. when I'm having a hard time, I feel like this little tap, mom, come on, you got this. Right. Let's go. Right. You're not done a little more. And I'm, I'm tired. No, you can do this. You know, uh, we're, we're pushing. And I like that you said that you said that Colette was your boss because that's how I feel about Ashley too. She's like, oh, no, no, we're not doing this. We're, right. you know? <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah, we got you things. Think you were allowed to like, you know, not do something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I love that you, yeah, that you're widening the foundation and that you're always thinking of new things because we have to keep moving and bringing different to the table and bringing that awareness you also mentioned something a little earlier in the show about collaboration and connecting and working together i'm mm -hmm. big on that and i feel that if we start collaborating with different organizations different foundations different individuals and their stories we are going to make a change we are going to make that difference. We can't do it alone, like you said, Michelle. We need other people. You know, uh, it's not a competition out there. It's joining hands and let's let's get a change in the world. Uh, you know, right. we really got to take that competition word out and just together yeah. in this. You know, and that we can learn from each other, right? Exactly. I learn just as much from any story I hear or any you know, data I hear from other organizations, from other lost parents, I learn more sometimes from that than anything else I can prepare myself for. Um, and I think that that's really key to remember those kinds of things because that's how we, we learn, you know, that's how we grow. And yeah, that working together is just, I mean, two heads are better than one and four are better than two and on and on yeah. um, all the way through. So uh, Michelle, do you have any final words before we wrap up? I would send some love to both you, Liz, and any other lost parents who might have listened in. Um, and, you know, I mean, I, I always love to hear about um, other people's angel babies. So you can always feel free to just contact me and say like, hey, I wanted to share. This is, this is my angel baby. I, I do really actually hold those very close. Um, and I do try to remember those um, individual stories a lot. Um, and I think, you know, if somebody has had a loss and hasn't come forward, I think do it whatever way you can, right? If you have to do it anonymously because you're not ready to it, if you want to do it very vaguely because you don't, you're not ready, like do it whatever way you can um, to whoever you can. Um, and if that is just as simple as, as calling up one friend and saying, hey, listen, I've never told you this and I need to tell you this. Um, or of the friend who knows and just saying, I really want to talk about my child and I want to talk about my story. Um, you know, do that. And... If you know somebody who has lost, give them a hug today, whatever that looks like, right? If it's a virtual hug, if it's uh, thinking of you, um, if you remember their angel baby's name, it means the world when somebody reaches out and, get, and shares your baby's name, right? When somebody says, um, thinking of you and Colette today, oh my God, right? The simplest text is the world to a lost parent and, you know, um, and so, you know, do those kinds of things. I mean, that's such a small ripple effect, but that can have such long lasting um, waves. Well, thank you so much, Michelle. And I, I agree with you. Say their names. We want to yeah. hear their names. You know, mm -hmm. we don't want to hear a baby girl, baby boy. We want to hear their names. You know, right. for the parents who were able to give a name to their child, say their names because it means right. a lot. You know, or did they have a nickname? You right? know, like um, Sweet Pea was a nickname. That was how you know big the baby was at the at the time, and so that was our nickname at, at the moment in time when we lost was Sweet Pea, um, and that's what we referred to him or her. I don't know um, as Sweet Pea, and that's that's our Sweet Pea. Um, you know, if people say that, I, I love it. You know, it's it's that kind of thing. So whatever it is that they do, um, if they have anything like that, um, just use it. It's the little things that make a difference. It really yeah. does make the impact. I want to get into really quickly before we wrap up, Michelle, where can people find you if they need to reach you? Yeah, so our website um, is ColetteLouise.com. Um, I see that it's on the screen, um, but Colette is two T's. Um, and um, they can reach us there on contact form. I 
well, you reach them. I'm Michelle um, with two L's um, at, um, at clutlouise.com. Um, feel free to send me an email. And, you know, we're on all the social media platforms and we would love to connect there, whatever way, you know, works for us. Um, but we have a lot to say, a lot to, to honor, but we also have a ton to learn. I mean, there's so much we don't know. And so we want to hear from you and we want to um, get that feedback. And if you can, or you know somebody who can, or you know a company that can, um, really, honestly, our, our capacity to give is based on the funds we have. And so anything that you can give, um, I can tell you 100% of every donation goes to families in crisis. We don't use it. We have a, a donor that specifically pays for any of our overhead. Um, so it's going straight to a family. Um, and it really does make a difference. And, and talking about little steps, I mean, little things add up. So um, if you can give, if you can direct me to somebody who can give, whatever it is, um, I'm always grateful for that as well. Well, thank you so much. And thank you so much for sharing your story, Michelle, with us this morning. Uh, so for anyone who's listening to the show right now or listening to the replay, please let me know where you're tuning in from. Hashtag replay and let me know where you tuned in from because I always like to know where you're coming in from. And again, Michelle, thank you for sharing your story. Um, and let's just share, share this tea time, share it with a loved one, share it with someone you know that it might help. And it might just bring them some hope, you know, because sometimes it's it's heavy, it's hard. And us sharing our stories will lighten you up a little. So again, I want to thank you, Michelle. I want to thank the listening audience. I want to thank everyone who supports Miss Liz's Tea Times. And again, if you'd like to know more information, check out her website, ColetteLouise.com. Uh, double T, like she said, and a double L for Michelle. So we got doubles going on. There's a mom and a daughter all the way straight through. So I, again, thank you for uh, to Colette for giving you this incredible foundation uh, and saving other people's lives. Uh, I will see everybody back at 3 p.m. for a second show today and then at 7 p.m. for the third show. Um, and we'll see where we're going next at 3 p.m. I'm going to just leave it at that. So if you want to tune in, you can tune in. And then in the evening, if you want to tune in, tune in. Uh, again, Michelle, thank you. Uh, don't leave. We're going to have a few words before we close up in the back. And again, I want to thank everyone for tuning in to Tea Time with Miss Liz. We're here to teach, educate, awareness on the tough subjects like today. So again, share this tea time, share it with a loved one and give someone a hug. You know, you never know who's who's hurting in silence. So uh, let's bring the awareness and let's stop the silence and let's start talking about um, this, this loss of ch children. You know, we need to start talking about our children. And I wanna thank Ashley for giving mommy the courage to do this tea time because this one was a hard one but i know mommy has things to do too so you're my little boss so i want to thank ashley for that and i want to thank you again michelle and thank you to your husband and your little guy thank so you. until then i will see everybody at 3 p.m with a second tea time